Well, let's go ahead and get started now. Welcome, good afternoon, and thank you for attending the New Resources Consulting Virtual Project Management Webinar. My name is Chris Downs, and I'm one of the presenters today. We have muted all the microphones and we'll have time at the end for some Q&A. Please feel free to submit your questions via chat or unmute at the end of the presentation. I would first like to thank our presenters today, especially our two clients who have taken the time out of their work schedule to be with us and bring us their experiences. First, I would like to introduce Stacy Romano with Cone Health. Stacy, could you please share some of your background? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacy Romano and I work at Cone Health, which is in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, the healthcare organization is five hospitals and over 150 physician practices. I am the uh, manager of the IT project portfolio and also project manage some of the larger initiatives that are actually in the um, in the portfolio. I've been at PMP since 2006. I'm on the board of our local PMI chapter and I do love project management and thank you all for coming and I'm excited to be together to learn about virtual management. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Danny Hansen with SSM Health. Danny, could you please share your background? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Danny Hansen. I'm the director of the IHT Project Management Office for SSM Health, which is a Catholic nonprofit healthcare organization serving the four states of Missouri, Oklahoma, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Like Stacy, I also hold a PMP certification in addition to a CPHIM certification through the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, where I currently serve as the Wisconsin Chapter President. Thank you, Danny. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Rick Troll with New Resources. Rick, could you please share your background? Hi, everybody. My name is Rick Troll. I'm a senior management consultant with New Resources. I have over 30 years of experience in the areas of IT and PMO management, project management, operational transformation, and strategic planning and development. Great. Thank you, Rick. And as mentioned, my name is Chris Downs. I'm the vice president of client delivery with new resources with overall responsibility of delivery of services to our clients. I earned my PMP in 2006, have had several years of consulting experience as well as executive, an executive in large IT organizations where I've built and led enterprise project management offices. Our goal today is to provide some insights and experience into the world of virtual project management, specific, specifically covering benefits of virtual project management, collaboration technology, some of the opportunities and challenges that we're seeing, meeting best practices, uh, virtual project management and how it impacts the knowledge areas and phases of projects, uh, COVID-19 specific implications, and then obviously questions and answers at the end. The desired outcomes for today is for the participants to understand the benefits and risks of virtual project management, uh, realize that virtual project management is still project management, just a bit more challenging. Uh, recognize if processes are immature within an organization, this will be amplified in this virtual setting. A look at best practices. Uh, recognize the impact on the project management knowledge areas and phases. Understand that communication is still the number one challenge. And also understand how COVID-19 has impacted our lives. At this point, I will turn the presentation over to Stacy. Thanks, Chris. First, we're going to discuss the benefits of virtual project management. It's always best to start with the positives. And across the um, icons, we have eliminates cost and lost productivity associated with travel. There have been plenty of times when we've gone to clients and thought that maybe we would be able to be productive in an airport, and that usually never works because, or we end up on the tarmac. Things don't work with productivity with travel. So definitely eliminated when we're in this virtual environment. On the um, next icon, the reduced facility cost. To me, that looks a little bit like toilet paper for some reason. And I know that we have spent a lot of money in our homes on toilet paper. And of course, the facilities that we used to be at have saved some money. So overall, if you're not at the uh, facility, it reduces the cost. Definitely a wider talent pool. You could pull from anybody as far as being online and everybody working from home from anywhere. When COVID-19 travel restrictions um, are lessened, then maybe we will all be able to project manage from the beach. It allows access from anywhere. The next one, reduce conference um, room requirements. I don't know about you guys, but I've had plenty of experience where I have an executive stakeholder or two and I get the right day and the right time and we're ready to meet. And then all of a sudden I try to find a conference room and there's no none to be found. 
now that we're all in this virtual environment, including our executives, they've had to learn how to work virtually as well. So it's much easier without having to worry about that conference room. It's key for us to teach our entire organization about project management. So when you do put your presentations together, if you go ahead and add some of your project management tools, that's just going to be better for all of us when we work through it that way. I would argue that maybe we weren't quite prepared when this happened on March 16th, but now we have gotten better prepared so that if there is interruption in our business, we can all work virtually and continue to move forward. The next one about life work balance, I just wanted to talk to everyone about that for a minute. When we first um, went virtual, all of us, I don't think we did well with work life balance, at least the colleagues that I spoke to. We would get up in the morning, we would roll out of bed literally, and then go right to our office or right to our kitchen table. And we hadn't been used to doing that before. So we ended up working entirely too much and maybe not moving around enough. I think after two months, we figured that out much better. And also another benefit is, is that it offers a green solution. There's no emissions going back and forth. I-40 when I drive um, my commute every day. Next slide, Chris. So we talked about the benefits. Let's talk about the high level risks when it comes to virtual project management. Um, the first one that I'm gonna mention when Chris, Danny and Rick and I were talking about it um, really resonated with me. Uh, lack of eyes on intelligence. I know I was struggling for the past two months, but it's nice when there's an actual label. Part of my project management skills over the years has been reading faces, reading body language, um, nuances when people talk or don't talk, and when you're virtual, you've kind of lost that. So that's a definite risk. Um, relationships, relationships, relationships. That is what project management is all about. And it is definitely harder to develop those relationships and gain that trust when you're in a virtual instead of a face-to-face. -face. It's just human nature to um, build better relationships when you can see people and be with people. On the restricted formal communication, again, we don't have that as much. We have no longer have the ITS all hands meetings with everyone, formal staff meetings when maybe you would discuss pieces or parts of your projects. So that's definitely a loss. But the next one's actually even more difficult. Those informal communications was everything. Maybe it was five minutes after a meeting where you talk to somebody who looked concerned, or maybe in the hallway somebody stops you to say they have another idea about a project. Uh, not having those anymore, that's kind of difficult. Of course, during the COVID-19, maintaining focus and attention is not just an issue for project managers, but also for our executives, sponsors, and um, team members. So we have to keep that in the back of our minds. The lack of online communication technology. We have WebEx, we have Skype, we have Zoom, we have, um, what do we have, Teams, we have it all. And all of a sudden, as project managers facilitating these meetings, we need to make sure that we can um, you know, learn everything we can so that we can help facilitate the struggles that people have when they're trying to do the new technologies. Poor connectivity is another one. I do want to speak to that. I know that um, we all struggle with meetings where somebody couldn't hear or somebody's scratchy. How do you handle that? I've, do I've done it two ways. I've tried to push through meaning I tried to figure out what's wrong with that person's particular audio or maybe didn't have that person on anymore. And I've also done it where I just canceled the meeting, figured out what happened and rescheduled. I think the second, the latter is the best way to go. If you're struggling with your connectivity, just go ahead and cancel the meeting and reschedule it. People seem to be understanding of that. If you have immature processes, maybe you recently put in a new change management process or recently put in a major incident management process, um, it's going to be more of a struggle now that we're all virtual, trying to figure out how to um, mature those processes faster. And of course, business design is not, you know, some business processes were not designed for virtual. And when we had to leave so quickly, I, I don't know about you guys, but we absolutely had business processes that required pieces of paper to be signed. So we quickly have to consider those. Culture, language, and diction are not just for virtual, but always um, a concern and something you have to take seriously with project management. Make sure that um, that you ask the clarifying questions, make sure you understand what's being said. The final one, online meeting fatigue is so important and such a big deal. I'm actually gonna share that in another slide coming up in a minute. 
This slide is just to discuss the fact that virtual project management is project management. We haven't done anything different. It's just a little more difficult to manage. We still have the project, time, scope, resources, costs. None of those skills that we have are lost. It's just a matter of trying to mitigate um, the risk that you have when you're doing it all virtually. Thanks, Chris. So great quote, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Everybody knows communicate, communicate, communicate. We cannot say that any, you know, enough. Um, the, the numbers are 7% of our skill, our listening skills are audio as far as communication, 38 are diction in, diction in your voice, and then 55% are nonverbal cues. So we have really lost close to 55% of our communication when we've gone um, virtual. Uh, sometimes folks do get on the video and you can read some faces, but for the most part, we're re relying on that 45% of audio and the tones of voices, which sometimes are hard. So keep communicating with your teams. So let's talk a little bit about online meeting fatigue because it is real. Um, it is very difficult when you're um, facilitating meeting to process the nonverbal cues. I wish that there was a verbal cue for eye rolls. I, I can't see the eye rolls anymore. I wish there would almost be a little blip or something so I would know because it's so important to know when they happen in a meeting. Um, but you are definitely stressing trying to make sure that you get, get the voices that you need to hear because you can't get to the nonverbals enough. Silence can be deafening. Um, maybe you, I'll give you an example. I did a full presentation. I spent a lot of time on it. It was a full 10 minutes. And at the end, are there any questions? And it's silence. You don't, you don't know what's going on there, where if you were in the room, you'd be able to read, read the room much better. Uh, Self-conscious of how you look on the um, screen all day long can be tiring. You don't want to move around too much when somebody else is um, maybe presenting or you have a lot of people on there. So you tend to try to be still. And you don't want to over, you know, you want to make sure that you look okay. We're project managers. We're used to being in front of the room. We're not looking at ourselves. We're looking at our team. So it's definitely added stress to you. We've already discussed the technical issues. There's environmental issues. We have kids in the background, dogs in the background, um, folks trying to figure things out. Um, so we have to be kind and cognizant of those. And one other piece of contributing factor is we're no longer just having our seven to nine meetings every day online. We also have Zoom meetings in the evening with our friends or our book clubs or our project management team. So there's a whole lot of day of meetings. So what can we do to make it better? Um, I think it's important to revalidate your standing meetings. Are they right? Are they working? You know, is the agenda right? Are the participants right? Go ahead and take a hard look at that and adjust as needed. Maybe they don't need to be as long, things like that. Um, not all calls need to be video calls. Sometimes putting on the baseball cap is just all you can do, so you just leave it on audio. Um, important to engage the participants. Find out, who, you know, pay attention to who's on this, who's on your meeting, ask questions, not hard questions, but soft questions to make sure that people are engaged and listening to what needs to get done. You need to take breaks personally between meetings. And if you're scheduling, say, a two hour meeting, you know, when we were all on site, maybe you would take a 10 minute break. I think it's important to take a 20 minute break now in between a longer meeting because people are at home and they might have things they have to get done and 20 minutes is just better for them. Um, meetings do seem to be shorter because we don't have that informal conversation anymore. I would just go ahead and keep them short. And lastly, get away from your desk. Stand up, do sit ups, do squats, do push ups, take a walk around the house. Um, please do not sit all day long in front of the computer and just stare at it. You're just gonna get worn out with that. So I did not know what online meeting fatigue was before, but I certainly do now. And there are some great ways that we can try to um, help mitigate it. Thanks, Chris. Now we're gonna pass it on to Danny, who's gonna talk about um, collaboration technology. All right, thank you, Stacy. 
Um, so Stacy talked a little bit about some of the risks and constraints of virtual project management, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, in good PM fashion, can prepare to mitigate and address some of these challenges, starting with our available collaboration technologies. So as we really think about the tools that we have available to us, it's important to remember to make a good use of everything at our disposal and use an appropriate blend of both the new and old school technologies. Um, we've got a lot of great technology available to us right now in terms of online collaboration platforms like Teams and Basecamp and SharePoint. And we've had some group messaging tools emerging more like WhatsApp and things like that. But be careful not to forget about the more traditional technologies like email or a simple phone call. Um, it's also important to make sure that everybody knows and understands how to use these tools. So does everyone know how to share their screen or transfer control or mute participants, record meetings? Uh, do they know where your meeting minutes are going to be stored afterwards and how to update your project raid log? If not, think about whether some tip sheets or recorded training sessions could add some value for your team. And in a lot of cases, YouTube or Google might already have some really good content that you can use as a jumping off point for these sorts of things. As we think about the skill set needed for successful project management, it's important to really first consider and understand whether your organization has any standards in place already for presentations, meetings, AV, and if they do, use them. Um, it's really a good idea to adhere to these standards and avoid trying to reinvent the wheel whenever possible. This is not only going to save you time, but it's also going to help your team have a seamless experience from project to project. From a security perspective, it's more important now than ever to ensure that we're being mindful of who has access to these tools, both internally and externally. So can your internal resources access these tools externally from home devices, mobile devices, things like that? Can your external resources from partner organizations log into your tools and collaborate in a centralized fashion? And then also consider what processes, controls, and audits you have in place surrounding these requirements. Also very important to be mindful when you're sharing your screen to close out of applications that use pop up notifications and have your content prepared ahead of time. If you like to use alt tab to switch between applications, be mindful that Windows 10 will display all of your open windows when you use that key combination. A lot of apps will allow you to limit some of this by sharing a particular application rather than your full desktop, but still something to be very mindful of. And then lastly, there's always those project specific considerations that need to be accounted for case by case. So how are you going to successfully train your end users in a purely virtual environment? What does testing and issue remediation need to look like? How are you going to make sure that your peer reviews or third party reviews are able to successfully occur? What does the goal live activation and support strategy look like? And then lastly, how are you going to celebrate your team's success in a more virtual landscape? So one of my favorite Ben Franklin quotes, uh, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. One of the best ways you can really set your projects and your team up for success is to do some proactive review of your landscape. Make sure you understand what you have available to you already and where you might have gaps or additional needs. Really think about inventorying your, avail inventorying your available tools. Um, see what you already have in house that can help you accomplish your project goals and then establish standards for the use of those tools if they don't already exist. Again, this is gonna help you, but even more so the consistency is gonna help your teams hit the ground running. Have a toolkit available for tip sheets and videos that can help you to quickly onboard new project resources and give them an immediate level of comfort and familiarity with these tools. And then just as with your tools, you should also have standards for records management. So where are your agendas and minutes and raid logs and status updates going to be stored? How are they going to be accessed and updated? Uh, again, utilize consistent online presentation practices and be mindful of what you're sharing. From a training perspective, really think about how your training is going to be delivered and get sign off from key project resources and stakeholders well in advance of training. So this is all well understood. Uh, think about who's going to conduct this training and who's going to receive the training. How is it going to be delivered? Are we going to use a recorded session that's available on demand, or is there going to need to be a live interactive training session? Uh, in either case, how can we make sure that the recipients are getting uh, the necessary technology in place ahead of time to be successful in training? And what are we going to do if they run into issues at the time of training? Are we going to need to have a registration mechanism or a tracking mechanism for participation? Are we going to need to have competencies? And if so, how are we going to do that? And how is that going to be tracked and reported upon in a virtual environment? All of these considerations as we start to look at things like training and testing. 
Um, again, really understand and communicate with your teams in advance what the expectations are for testing. Uh, is there going to be merit in considering the use of a shared collaborative platform like Teams or Google Docs to centralize one single source of truth script that everyone can be accessing and updating simultaneously, rather than trying to keep track of nine different versions of an Excel document that's getting kicked around four different email chains? Um, and then again, whatever your strategies are in this regard, make sure that the appropriate access is in place and that that's being audited and controlled. And lastly, as with anything we do as project managers, continuously collect and act upon the lessons learned so that you can continue to improve your processes. All right, so really knowing your tools. Project managers are uniquely positioned in regard to tools and technology because there's really an inherent obligation to not only know and understand a wide variety of these types of productivity applications, but also to be able to adapt the capabilities of these tools to best meet the needs at hand. Uh, these expectations are only amplified in a virtual environment. So to take virtual meetings as an example, in addition to knowing the basics like how to schedule a meeting and start and end your calls and look at your participant list, a project manager can really benefit by having some lesser known tips and tricks in their back pocket. So for instance, do you know how to turn off the entry and exit announcements on a meeting with several participants so you can minimize disruption when folks are arriving late? Do you know how to zoom in on documents or use a virtual whiteboard to jot out a quick network diagram or a mind map? Can you look at the attendee list, quickly identify whose dog is barking in the background and mute them? Uh, these might seem like little things, but they can really help to bring your meeting facilitation game from good to great and help make sure your team stays focused on the task at hand. If you don't know how to do these kinds of things, ask or Google it. Um, check in with your peers to see what's working well for them and share the tricks that you know of. Uh, develop tip sheets again where appropriate. And if you see a peer do something that you think added value to their meeting, ask them about it afterwards. They will likely be happy to share that knowledge with you, and then you'll in turn be able to share that with others. Even if you're a master at one of these tools, an occasional quick Google or YouTube search for tips and tricks might reveal to you a few neat features or functions that you didn't even know existed that can really help you maximize your use of these tools. One of the challenges I've personally been experiencing, and Stacy alluded to this a little bit as well, is um, meetings seem to be getting shorter and more frequent. So instead of going from back to back hour long meetings, we're now going from back to back 30 minute meetings or even 15 minute meetings. And while I'm not going to turn this into a lecture on calendar management or time defense, I do want to quickly talk about a few best practices for these meetings to help ensure that you're getting the most bang for your buck out of that limited time you have with your team. So as you think about scheduling your meeting, make sure that your invite is sent out soon enough to give people time to make necessary accommodations. Uh, make sure you try to accommodate their schedules the best you can as well, and make sure that you have the appropriate duration for the meeting. In the vein of having those back-to-back -back meetings, really consider whether you wanna institute a five-minute rule. So this is where your 30-minute meetings will conclude after 25 minutes, and your 60-minute meetings will conclude after 55 minutes to give a natural five-minute window of time for folks to take a quick bio break or refill their coffee or send off an email so that they can arrive to the next meeting focused and ready to go. Uh, this is sometimes easier said than done, um, but if it is successful, it can really give people that needed break. Um, also, make sure that you consider your audience. Use the required and optional attendee settings on your invite so that you can make sure that people understand whether they're needed or nice to have. Um, sometimes we have a propensity to over invite people in an effort to try to make sure no one feels left out. But if you consider uh, the rates of everyone attending these meetings, costs can really add up quickly, especially for standing or recurring meetings. So it's really important to make sure everyone at the table is actively contributing to the goals and objectives and discussion at hand. If you're an organization that depends on quorum for voting matters, make sure that you understand what constitutes a quorum and what you can and can't do without a quorum. Um, when you're invited to a meeting, make sure that you accept or decline in a timely fashion so that the host can make adjustments. Uh, if you can't attend a meeting, consider whether you can send a delegate or commit to catching up afterwards by reviewing the meeting minutes. Once you've got your meeting scheduled, you should be focusing on your preparation. And it may be natural to think that a meeting's value and effectiveness comes from the discussion that occurs during the meeting, but I'll tell you all right now that the true value of any successful meeting really lies in the preparation. Uh, you'll very often get more value out of a 15 minute meeting that was well prepared for than you will out of an hour long meeting that was thrown together with no real forethought or agenda. So to that end, every meeting that you schedule should have an agenda that adequately details the attendees, the purpose, the expectations, accountabilities, topics at hand, et cetera. Again, if your organization has a template for this, make sure that you use it. 
Um, if you need a meeting scribe or other facilitation resource, make sure those resources are identified and the responsibilities are well defined and understood in advance of the meeting. Uh, your agenda and any other resources that you plan to discuss should be distributed well in advance of your meeting so that teams can review them ahead of time and come prepared to discuss. I typically like to encourage these go out no later than close of business the day before the meeting. And then lastly, just before your meeting starts, again, really prepare your workspace, close out of things you're not going to be using, open up the documents you do plan to reference so that you're ready and prepared for the meeting. And then as we move into meeting facilitation, uh, make sure that you jump on early because you never know when Skype is going to crash on you or your phone's going to lock up and need a quick reboot. And the last thing you want to do is have everybody hanging out on the line waiting for you to show up wondering if maybe they missed a cancellation notice. Use your agenda to really drive the meeting and keep people on task. Um, keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Even if you do plan on being quiet, you never know when you're going to sneeze or the mailman's going to come by and set the dog off. So just best to stay on mute if you're not contributing to the discussion. Conversely, when you are speaking, uh, make a point to be articulate and concise. Speak slowly and clearly, particularly with these virtual technologies. Voice clarity and intonation don't always translate as well as we'd hope, so it's really important to make a conscious effort in this regard. Um, as the meeting is occurring, don't hesitate to use your parking lot to take topics offline if they're starting to derail the agenda or if they need more or less resources in order to be effectively addressed. Uh, this next one's really a big one. Update your agenda real time as the discussions are occurring. So write down who is owning what work, when the work is due. This is really going to help you clarify questions real time and also make sure that the resource accountability is there when you ask for a status update on those assignments at your next meeting. Uh, again, record and archive your meetings and make sure everyone knows where to find those recordings and archives. And lastly, make sure to end your meetings on time or early. Uh, and it doesn't say it here, but really make sure to start your meetings on time as well. Sometimes there's a tendency to want to wait a couple of minutes for people to get on, but that really only serves to punish those who did show up on time. So if individuals join late, you can always circle back on a topic or they can catch up later by reading your minutes. And then when your meeting has concluded, make sure you take care of the necessary follow ups. So distribute those notes, send out a link to the recording, any relevant documents. I even sometimes go as far as to put a useful link section at the bottom of my meeting agendas and minutes to give people some fingertip access to the team site or the raid log or maybe a SAS application URL, um, things like that that really help get them where they need to be as quickly as possible. And these sorts of communication should go out no later than close of business the day of the meeting. Hold your team accountable to these minutes and assignments. Again, this is going to be a lot easier to do if you were sharing the notes as the meeting was occurring, and if you have names and dates assigned to the topics and assignments, uh, but you should also have a mechanism for tracking these, and this is where your RAID log can really come in handy. Make sure your team knows where and how to access and update this document and what's expected of them in that regard. That RAID log can really be a beneficial review topic on your standing meetings to help make sure that you and your team are maintaining mutual visibility into the status of those assignments. And then lastly, again, make sure you're gathering feedback and continuing to improve these processes. So what are we going to do when things eventually blow up or something happens that throws all of your hard work and planning out the window? Um, the first and most important thing to do is to stay calm, uh, because even though we don't know when or how these issues are going to crop up, we do know that eventually they will. And as we all know, life is 10% about what happens to you and 90% about how you respond. And since we're all great project managers, we've hopefully proactively considered how we're going to respond to most of these situations. But let's just take a few quick examples. So let's say you're lacking quorum. Again, you really need to understand ahead of time what you can and can't do without a quorum and have a process in place for this type of situation. Maybe you condense your agenda to the topics that don't require a quorum, or you adjourn the meeting to a later date and time. Um, but then if you do that, work really closely with your attendees to make sure that on the next occurrence, you will have quorum present. Uh, what can we do about background noise? So first of all, limit your own background noise by staying muted when you're not talking and know how to mute others if they're being disruptive. Um, you should also take appropriate measures to reduce the opportunity for background noise ahead of time by getting into a room with a closed door or putting pets outside before you get on the call. Um, also make sure that you tell others offline after the call if their background noise was being problematic. 
Um, I have a recent example. I was on a call with a coworker who was hosting a meeting and doing a lot of the talking. There were some points in the call where I couldn't hear what he was saying over the sound of his dogs barking. So um, other participants were really polite about this, made a couple comments, you know, what kind of dogs do you have or how many dogs do you have? But I made a point to tell this individual after the call just specifically how disruptive the noise was. And as it turned out, um, he was in a separate room on a headset with the door shut, had no idea that they were coming across as anything more than just some background noise. So really be comfortable having those conversations conversations when you need to to make sure that everybody can improve. Um, what happens again if you have poor audio or video quality? Stacy talked a little bit about this earlier, but here again, you're benefiting yourself and your team by sharing your materials in advance of the meeting. It's nice to share your notes real time, but if you're having video issues, you can at least follow along together. Uh, might also be worth considering whether video is needed or if you can get by with just audio. Sometimes that'll solve headaches if you're having some bandwidth constraints. So um, can the video, can the screen sharing, and just go to audio if all else fails. Uh, what about just general access problems? What happens if somebody can't get logged into Skype or there's a plugin that takes admin permissions in order to get installed? Um, it's really good to encourage your team members to test their access ahead of time, but it's also good to keep that direct dial-in number handy. Uh, most online meetings will have one, and if your participants are having trouble getting connected to the virtual meeting, that dial-in number can at least get them on the audio so they can participate in that fashion. Uh, anyone here ever have a meeting agenda get hijacked and go way down a rabbit hole that you never intended or expected? I'm assuming everybody is nodding. Um, so this is where a clear agenda and schedule can really pay off. Uh, you can delegate a timekeeper if you need to to help keep things on time and topic, or you can serve in that role yourself. And then again, really don't hesitate to make use of that parking lot or suggest a conversation be taken offline out of courtesy to the other meeting participants. And then last, but certainly not least, what can we do if someone is just plain not cooperating? Um, this is hopefully infrequent, but unfortunately it does happen. And again, the best thing we can do is be prepared for how we're gonna handle it. Again, first and most important, remain calm. Uh, consciously exude that calm as you speak and as you respond. As the PM, you really set the tone for your whole project. And as the meeting facilitator, you're setting the tone for the meeting. So people will take a cue from you and your behavior and respond accordingly. Uh, next, quickly consider where this behavior may be stemming from. So maybe they don't agree with the project's objectives, or maybe they're concerned that the project is going to have an adverse impact on their workflows or their team. Maybe they have a real legitimate concern that's a risk to the project that they feel isn't being given the appropriate attention. In either case, consider that as you frame your response, but generally speaking, often best to really calmly thank the individual for expressing the concern, note the details and take a personal follow-up that you're going to review it further and connect with them offline. This is going to do a few good things for you. First, it's going to buy you time to collect the relevant detail. It's going to give the individual a sense that their concerns have truly been heard and are being addressed. And it's going to create a nice opportunity for you to connect with the individual offline one-on-one -on -one and follow-up where you can really address that concern and bolster your rapport with them. Um, even though these types of individuals can be challenging, they can also become some of your strongest advocates or champions for the project if you successfully address those concerns and get them into your camp. So again, just remember that these sorts of issues really are more a matter of when than if, but if you plan ahead, stay calm, and remember that as the meeting facilitator, you are setting the tone. I'm confident you'll come out on top. And with that said, I'd like to quickly thank all of you for your time and attention as I turn things over to Rick. Thank you, Danny. Many of us on this call have plenty of experience hosting conference calls, facilitating meetings online, and managing remote or distributed teams. And COVID-19 has certainly made working from home and online meetings more common. I'd like to talk about further developing our proficiency with virtual project management and optimizing our effectiveness as project managers in this environment. And the first step I'd like to talk about is essentially a risk assessment step. And when managing a virtual project, it's important to consider what makes a virtually managed project different from a traditionally managed project. You may find that there are risks and opportunities with virtually managing a project, and these risks and opportunities impact multiple areas and vary by project. I find it very useful to use the 10 knowledge areas of project management as a framework for assessing the risks associated with any project, but particularly with virtual managed projects. Uh, the advantage they provide is they cover the, the entire universe of processes you will use to manage the project. The maturity of the process supporting the 10 knowledge areas should also be considered as gaps in any of those processes will be wider in a virtual environment. If you have current issues with scope management, they will be more challenging to manage over the wire. 
You should also determine how much experience the team has with managing projects virtually. IT may be very comfortable with the online tools and meetings, but other areas or individual team members may have little or no experience working in a virtual team or project environment. In summary, conduct a risk assessment across the knowledge areas to determine where the risks are and how those risks will be mitigated during the life cycle of your project. I'd like to turn now to the initi initiation and planning stage and take a look at that from a virtual perspective. As Danny stated earlier, referencing Ben Franklin, be prepared. It made me think of uh, Yoda from Star Wars. There was a quote I saw of his, I don't know that he actually said this in any movie, but he said, plan not, fail you will. So it's important at this stage to make sure that the people, the processes and the technology are all ready to go coming out of the initiation and planning stage and before kicking off the execution of the project. Looking at people, referencing Stacy's uh, recommendations, establishing relationships is key as in any project, but more difficult if people have never met in person before. Don't hesitate to discuss this challenge with your sponsor and steering committee to make sure they are aware of it, gather their thoughts and ideas, and address concerns. This is also where you begin to win the trust and confidence of your sponsor and steering committee and assess the alignment of the steering committee in regard to project goals and objectives. This is a challenge in person, but more difficult over the wire. Again, discuss these challenges openly and frankly with your team and develop strategies for mitigating those risks. It's also helpful to set up regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with the sponsor, team leads, and steering committee for the life cycle of the project, and utilize informal communication techniques to build the relationships. Implement a thorough onboarding process for team members. This will be critical at the beginning of the project, but also during the project as new people are added to the team. And finally, make sure the project team is trained on the collaboration tools as well as any of the other tools being used to manage the project. Looking at processes, make sure the project management plan defines the virtual approach and that the collaboration processes related to the 10 knowledge areas are defined as well. Projects and standards and resources for record management should be established prior to commencing project team meetings and verify the team is trained on those tools and the record management processes. It's also another good opportunity to review best practices regarding online meetings with the team. And I think it's wise to get the virtual and project management approach formally accepted by the sponsor and the steering committee. In terms of technology, uh, take inventory of what collaboration tools exist in your environment and establish a tool standard for project management and collaboration technology. It's also good to be aware of new tools emerging. This technology is rapidly evolving and it's not uncommon to be in the middle of a project and only to find out that they're switching from Skype to Teams and people need to be retrained on the tool set. Implement appropriate levels of security for internal and external resources. If you have vendor partners that are gonna participate in the meetings, make sure that they have access to your environment. And then before you ever do anything in terms of executing the project, test those collaboration tools prior to the project kickoff. I'd like to now put the spotlight on stakeholder and communication management. Um, this slide covers some basic project management 101 material, but I want to highlight the importance of these two knowledge areas, given how critical they are to the success of the project. It's important to create a brand and elevator speech for the project and market it to the organization. This gives the project visibility and helps align people with its goals and objectives. The brand and message should be consistently and frequently presented through all the electronic channels of communication. This is Generally, good advice regarding any project, but if you're going to be managing the project across multiple sites in a virtual environment, it's essential that you maintain its visibility and keep it in front of people. Organizational change management, again, another continual challenge for a project manager. Make sure you understand the impact of the project, um, how will it impact the organization, and work with your organization's uh, business partners to develop approaches for managing those changes. Uh, make use of your on-site resources to observe and gather feedback. Personal calls to the department managers are a useful tool for identifying risks and determining the effectiveness of your organizational change management processes. Don't forget about the value of informal communication. 
Uh, replace the walkarounds with personal telephone calls and or email messages. Call on on-site resources to provide feedback. Email, phone calls, and text messaging can also be used to offer encouragement, share success stories, and get quick updates. All these activities help build those relationships and deepen the trust of the team members. Make sure your project manage, your project kickoff covers all the virtual processes and tools. Uh, teams should be made aware of the risks and opportunities of the virtual environment. Um, you should also enlist your sponsor and steering committee to act as project ambassadors, arm them with the elevator speech and encourage them to get out and about to spread the message. Keep your team leads close, communicate with them individually on a regular basis. They are also project managers and you can help them with the virtual project management process and tools and their feedback will help you do better as well. And as we've said before, gather feedback from everyone, share the lessons learned to help build the team's proficiency. Looking next into the execution stage of a project, um, I'd like to talk about meetings a little bit. We talked about meeting best practices, but in, in this case, I did stress the overall meeting structure and stress consistency in terms of how they are managed and what tools are used. It's important to establish a standing meeting schedule that flows in a logical manner to support the week's activities and avoids redundancy. And this can be coordinated with the team leads, work with them to establish continuity in how the project meetings are facilitated, what processes and tools are going to be used, utilized, and then make sure that they're being utilized consistently. Uh, the project manager and team lead should also work together to create a consistent experience for the project team members. This will help the team perform better to your expectations. And as an aside, make sure to introduce new team members or guests in your online meetings. There may have not been any opportunity to walk them about and introduce them to people in person. Looking at deliverables, uh, developer collaboration may need to take place virtually. It's helpful to review the development process with the technical leads and evaluate whatever risks and opportunities are there relative to the online approach. Um, one advantage is that development teams often have fairly mature online collaboration practices in place already, and you may be able to learn from them and leverage their experience to the benefit of a larger team. Uh, the project manager should also monitor and assist with the virtual collaboration process and understand the dynamics taking place so that you can make adjustments. Peer review and deliverable acceptance online. Um, can be hampered by document types. An example would be large and complex Visio documents or document formats that may require specific viewers. Not all documents present well on a small laptop screen and needs to be a hundred page document can't be reviewed online very easily as well. So you may need to take some creative steps to uh, enable this process online. Um, Deliverable acceptance may need to be accomplished online. Your organization may or may not utilize electronic signatures, but you may be able to utilize your uh, email application to document acceptance of deliverables. Vendors and third parties, they already may be online and helping with deliverables, but there may be some specific activities that require access to the physical environment and that may present some challenges and require process or task assignment changes. Be aware that time may be required of your internal resources if they have to become the, um, the eyes and the hands on the environment in place of your vendor. In terms of training, um, you need to determine what capabilities and tools you have for online training and plan accordingly. A lot of organizations have these tools, but it's good to, to verify that. A lack of access to the physical training environment may complicate delivery. Um, validation of training results may also need to be accomplished online. You need to understand what kinds of tools are there for uh, uh, training, testing, and assurance. You may also have new team members that join the project at the training stage, and they may not have the skills or knowledge about the online approach and will require some support. Testing is similar. You need to review the types of testing and determine if they can be supported online. Uh, again, lack of access to the physical environment may require some changes to your standard approach. Um, of note, online testing may be a step forward in the quality or the thoroughness of disaster recovery and business continuity testing. 
Uh, user acceptance testing coordination may be a challenge across multiple locations and over the wire. And this phase again may introduce new team members that need support to get up to speed. I'd like to uh, take a, a moment to stress the importance of testing and training leads. They are important partners to the project manager in any project as their work streams are dependent upon the deliverables produced out of requirement design and development activities. They are also often experts regarding the functionality of the current system and will ask penetrating questions regarding the future state. In my experience, good testing and training leads are the first to identify problems in the design and usually have a good sense of scope or schedule risks. In terms of communication, I'm reminded of the idiot um, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, there's a risk that people feel like nothing is happening with a project when activity is not physically concentrated in a location or when there's a lack of information communicated to the team and stakeholders about what is really happening. So establish and maintain a consistent schedule of communications. Uh, continue to drive your message and mark the project on a frequent basis. Keep people aware of upcoming milestones and critical events and the successes of the project. Also consider publishing a monthly newsletter or scheduling online lunch and learn sessions to raise awareness. Uh, the implementation phase of a project is interesting from a uh, virtual standpoint. Uh, readiness assessment and the go, no go decision may be difficult to validate and may be difficult to also get the go decision in an environment if the decision makers are uncomfortable with the online process or lack of in-person contact and direct access to the environment. Plan early for this and walk through the process with the decision makers well ahead of when it's needed. Um, implementation support will also require online processes for team coordination, issue tracking, status updates, et cetera. Um, and again, new team members may come into play at this point and will need some support. An online command post is a really useful tool for coordinating implementation activities, and that can be a center for providing regular updates, uh, addressing specific issues, uh, scheduling executive um, online meetings to provide them with updates on the status. And you may have heard of this one before, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, looking at the monitoring and control stage, um, my first piece of advice would be use your tools. Virtual project management provides a great opportunity to leverage your investment in tools like your portfolio and project management software, your record repositories, your raid tracking applications, uh, defect management applications, testing and training tools. Um, using these tools in real time and virtual meetings reinforces the process they support and keeps the team focused on the master sources of information about the project. It also reinforces accountability as tasks, issues, et cetera, pop up with names, status, and due dates. A little peer pressure can be an effective motiv motivator. And continued use of these tools will just build your proficiency as an organization around those standard processes. Uh, status reporting should be driven by those tools and the data they contain. This reduces your work as a project manager, leverages the tools in the process, and it also avoids creating a, another project reality. Accountability, establish and reinforce the roles and responsibilities. Be consistent on driving towards target dates for minor and major items alike. Uh, utilize your tools to highlight assignments, due dates, and status and mentor your team leads on the online tools and processes. Check in, see how they are doing, adjust as necessary, and make sure that you and the team leads are working um, consistently in a, enforcing that accountability. Uh, records management should be monitored on a regular basis to ensure deliverables and work in progress is being posted and updated to the right directories. Those records need to be up to date and available in the right place to be effectively used in online meetings. And just a reminder, this is a project one project management 101 item, but with all the focus on the, all the virtual activities, don't forget that you still need to keep a close watch on uh, your schedule, budget, and benefits, and watch out for scope creep. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate that the sponsor and the steering committee sh should be called upon and even other on-site resources to gather feedback for you um, on the performance of the project and the team dynamics, so you have an opportunity to address any issues or take advantage of opportunities. Um, 
It's also good to utilize electronic signatures for deliverable acceptance, change request approvals, et cetera. Don't let acceptance linger. Set a date for acceptance or rejection and make sure that you and the people involved understand the dependencies related to those deliverables. And again, evaluate and adjust online collaboration processes as lessons are learned. When we get to the project evaluation and closure stage, um, this doesn't change in, in, in great ways, but it's important to make sure that the acceptance of the project is secured and that may need to be processed electronically. Uh, the final handover of the systems to, to operations should be part of your implementation planning to allow for validation and acceptance online. Um, again, this should be planned well ahead of time with the operational stakeholders so there's no issues um, at a critical time in the project. Uh, make sure you communicate closure of the project to the organization and cancel any remaining meeting occurrences. Uh, some of your wrap-up activities may need to be conducted online rather than in person. It's easy to do project evaluations using SurveyMonkey or, or similar tools. You can also make phone calls to individuals and schedule group online meetings uh, to gather lessons learned and feedback on project performance. Also make sure that the final versions of project records are archived and locked down in a read-only state. Update security, especially for third parties that have had access to your environment. And then make sure that lessons learned are utilized to update the online collaboration process and share them with the larger organization so that everybody can benefit. Finally, make sure you celebrate the success of this project. Be creative, link on site and online activities, and list on site resources to help create and organize special events and recognize the teams accomplished. And make sure your sponsor and steering committee are enlisted to participate in these celebrations and to share their appreciation to the team. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, and thank you, Danny and Stacy as well. Uh, appreciate uh, your thoughts and input and time and talent. In summary, we'd like to have you take away the following. Project management practices will remain the same in a virtual uh, environment, just a bit more difficult. Managing projects virtually comes with both benefits and risks. Project managers need to develop specific skills for managing projects virtually, as we've talked about today. Online collaboration tools need standards and people will need training. Uh, risk management and mitigation plans are still a key project success factor. Again, we, we stressed it multiple times, over communicate, over communicate. Um, you will need to adjust your project management approach as needed in the, in the virtual world. And then moving on to some COVID-19 uh, direct impacts, uh, you'll need to consider the following uh, resource, resources and their availability. Uh, it, th people's lives are changing, uh, the, the timing, time zones, uh, people's uh, commitments, th th this is becoming an issue. Changing business priorities. Many companies are revisiting their strategic plans. Changing business priorities. Um, I think that 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 is is going on and on again. Uh, there's a lot of uh, changes that are are causing companies to relook at things. Vendor availability and lead times uh, are can be longer if uh, if not even uh, products and people not being available. Travel restrictions, both internally and externally. Uh, facility access. Some facilities are closed. Uh, changing technical and functional requirements as our environment has changed, as the world has changed, that could impact the projects. Obviously, with COVID-19, a lot of our schedules have had changes and the, the impacts and what does it look like? Productivity, people have some, some people have increased productivity, others have decreased. Uh, socioeconomic impacts, how is this infecting people personally? Culture, how has that impacted the organization? And obviously the office environment of people's places at home and what does the return to work look like? Um, at this point, uh, we would uh, like to thank you for your uh, attention. Um, I would personally like to thank uh, Stacy and Danny and Rick again for their time and talent. Um, we will be distributing the virtual PM toolkit as uh, promised. This session was, was recorded and will also be available on the new resources website. And we'd like to open it up at this point for questions. You can either submit those via chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, uh, we'd welcome them. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes, this is Penny with SSM. Um, with the 
standard tool in training. I mean, I know we're leaders as project managers. We, we lead this team. We get the, the team buy-in. Um, how do we get a really good team feeling, that team spirit, when we're dealing virtually? Because I, you know, you can encourage people face-to-face. You could say, come on, team. You know, we're all doing this together. How do you really, I know I can do that over the computer, but it doesn't feel the same. I don't feel like I'm getting the team buy-in like I used to. Penny, this is Stacy. That's an excellent question. And I, I struggle with that too. Again, you're used to leading and having folks, um, you feel them as they're moving along. What I've done is I do some more personal phone calls or more personal meetings one-on-one. -on -one. That does seem to feel a little better. And just know that um, it doesn't feel the same when you're, um, on a virtual meeting as you are face-to-face. -face. I'll add that there's a particular challenge with that if the team has not met each other in person and they don't have the experience of, of knowing each other um, in, in a close way. Um, it may be helpful to schedule some events that are maybe not critical to moving deliverables for, but are, may, are maybe uh, some warm-up exercise. Your HR department may be able to provide uh, some games or exercises that you can play in an in an online meeting format that are just fun and 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 just focused on people learning a little bit more about each other and sharing stories. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any uh, any other questions? Hey guys, Matt Krieger here. Um, good stuff. First of all, second of all, my my question is: I like to employ the technique of you know drive bys to you know key stakeholders to get their input and help keep things moving forward. Any techniques around that in a virtual environment? Yeah, I think here again, this is Danny. Um, you know, you can really leverage the the simple phone call. You know, the the old school technologies. You don't necessarily get to have the face to face opportunity. If you can do a quick video call, even better. Um, but if you're able to connect with them in that fashion, that's still very helpful. It's an informal setting. You know, you're not going to necessarily have that agenda, but you can really just sit down together, catch up, see how the friends and the family are doing, um, see how quarantine is going, but then also have those conversations around the unspoken questions or concerns that aren't going to come out in a standing meeting, but that you still would often get in those drive by sort of scenarios. Thanks. Do we have any other questions from the group? This is Penny. I have one more. <laughs> Leave it to me. Um, how do you really suggest a consistent way of delivering this elevator speech to our sponsors and keeping these projects visible for everyone because we tend to zero in on our team we know our sponsors but sometimes it's still if we don't hold the visibility we should yeah that's a good point um first of all i would say that the elevator speech is the responsibility of the project sponsor and the steering committee. They're the ones that are driving um, the business objective and the business rationale for doing the project. And I think that they should be the ones that um, put that together with the help of whatever uh, professionals you have on hand to craft those messages. Also, I think everybody at the senior level needs to work together with the project manager to uh, develop an effective communication plan. And that's so, again, if you have a, a capable marketing department or communications organization, they can help with the word crafting, with the development of a logo or some kind of brand around that message and maybe make some suggestions about utilizing their talents towards spreading that message to the organization as a whole. And in my experience, it's usually most successful if they apply the same rigor uh, to an internal messaging um, campaign as they would to an external messaging campaign. Thank you. This is Stacy. One other um, smaller way to do that is on your email tags, wherever, you know, if there's something really important for everybody to get on your email signature, go ahead and put it there as well. A project website is another good tool for that as well. Okay, fantastic. 
Well, with that, um, I'd really like to thank again all the participants for joining. We really appreciate it. Again, special uh, a shout out again to uh, both Stacy Romano and Danny Hansen, uh, our two clients that joined, and, and Rick Roll for his uh, input, and uh, some of the other folks who worked in the background to help us put this together. So uh, thank you. Um, hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and everyone stay safe. Uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to myself. Um, my contact information is on, on this slide as well as will be on our website um, or anyone on the panel. We look forward to speaking with you and uh, moving forward on project management. Safe and healthy to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you very much.